Uh, so welcome everyone today to our re MS Translat researcher interview uh, and it's our pleasure today to be joined by uh, Dr. Carlos Guerrino Guell. Uh, we did practice that before we came online because of my Australian accent. Um, who joins us from the University of British Columbia. Um, and you may have heard of him before based on one of the research summaries that we've just done recently uh, based on their finding of a, a gene mutation that may be linked to progressive forms of MS. Um, so Dr. Villarino Guell has been happy to join us today to talk about um, this study. Um, so if you wouldn't mind maybe just starting by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you um, and the study that you've just done. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Brad. Um, so as Brad mentioned, my name is Carlos Villarino Guell. I'm a assistant professor and a Canada research chair at the University of British Columbia. And we've been working uh, for the last few years on identifying um, mutations that actually cause multiple sclerosis in families. There has been uh, many genes and genetic factors uh, that have been identified as risks for multiple sclerosis as well as environmental factors. But none of these uh, factors that have been identified are really causative. They all have a really small effect on the overall risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Um, so I was very lucky when I joined this university and this department that there were a collection of about 2,000 families um, from multiple sclerosis patients. And those are families in which there are several family members who have been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And the idea is that in these families, which is probably only about 15% of all patients that have family history, in these specific families, there would be one gene, which would be the, the major responsible for the onset of multiple sclerosis. Um, so out of these 2,000 families or so, there were uh, about 100 in which there, we had DNA for four or more uh, patients um, in, this, in these families. And these are the ones that we started working on. Obviously, this uh, work takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, so we started with only four or five families, which we have been characterizing. And uh, one of these families is the one that led to the discovery of a mutation on NR1H3 nuclear receptor um, to regularize the expression on, on many different genes. So what we found is that this one mutation was found in, in two families from our collection. And uh, in contrast with the other mutations, this, uh, this mutation that we identify in this family is not causative. It doesn't cause disease absolutely in everybody, but it's the strongest risk factor for multiple sclerosis that has been described to date. And in these two families specifically, the risk of developing multiple sclerosis is about 60 to 70 percent for the people who presented the mutation, which is really high. In Canada specifically, the risk of multiple sclerosis is about 0.1 percent. Um, the previously identified genetic risk factors could increase that by as much as maybe 0.3 to 0.5 percent. So really the increase that the mutation we have identified um, provides is, is much, much higher. And therefore it's, it's completely different and completely unprecedented when you compare it to the previously known risk factors for multiple sclerosis. Yeah, that, um, that, that's really interesting and obviously hugely um, important. Do you have an idea, and I, and I know you mentioned this slightly in the paper, um, an idea as to how this mutation um, may be causing or increasing the risk of, of MS so much? Um, we have kind of working hypotheses which characterize uh, the biology of the mutation and we know more or less the mechanism of uh, things that are disrupted in the cell. Um, what NR1H3 is, is a transcription factor that regulates the expression of many different genes. So when you have the mutation, uh, this protein that NR1H3 synthesizes no longer works. Um, so what happens is that all the genes that are regulated by this protein is, are no longer efficiently regulated. So you get uh, a lot of uncontrolled expression of very important things like uh, inflammatory mediators and myelin genes, which are two key factors in multiple sclerosis. What we think may be happening is that something triggers an inflammatory response. Could it be a viral infection or who knows, whatever it is. And when this 
reaction, this inflammation starts and fixes the problem, the, the agent that has triggered it, it should normally stop. What we think happens is that in these people that have mutation, there's a kind of a runaway inflammatory reaction that can be stopped. And after it's, it's been started, it starts attacking the myelin. And that's how you create the damage in the, in the myelin and the neurons. Eventually, you stop this inflammatory response, but it's a bit too late. You already have started targeting and affecting things that you're not supposed to be affecting. And then when you try to come over and repair the myelin damage, the myelin genes are also regulated by this gene, and therefore you also cannot fix the problem appropriately. So it's kind of a double, uh, double accident in a way. You have too much inflammation that damages too many things, and then you cannot repair the damage that you have created. But this is, as I said, is a, is a working hypothesis from the, the function we know that the gene does and some um, animal models in which this uh, gene has been studied. Okay. And, and I guess that links a little bit to uh, the theory that once it starts, you can't stop. That links a little bit to, you saw quite a common clinical phenotype in people with MS that, that had this mutation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the thing that is very interesting is that the majority of the people who present the mutation that we have identified uh, were diagnosed with primary progressive MS or a rapidly progressive form of secondary progressive MS. I think there was only one uh, family member who was initially diagnosed with relapsing remitting but became progressive within three years of the onset. And the severity scale for all these uh, family members is, is pretty high and it went uh, pretty severe quite fast. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very progressive and it's very debilitating. And the, the thing is that there's no treatments currently for progressive forms of MS. Uh, we have treatments for relapsing remitting and they are to a degree effective, but when patients become progressive, there's really very little that we can do. So we're hoping that you know, with this mutation that we can identify the pathways that actually cause the onset of disease, the onset of the progressive form of the disease, and it's going to help us develop new treatments by knowing exactly the mechanisms that trigger this uh, progressive phase. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's crucially important because, as you say, I mean, there really is nothing out there at the moment for, for mm -hmm. people with these progressive forms of the disease, and being able to, to get something that's targeted based on knowing what's what's going on is, mm -hmm. is really important. Um, I guess the last couple of questions just for, for people with MS who are going to be watching this. The first one we talked to, uh, about a little bit already but before we started recording, but is this at a, a point where you would be suggesting people with MS specifically, I guess primary progressive MS, should be going out and looking at getting this sequence to see whether or not they have this mutation? Um, I think for the majority of people uh, doing the genetic screening is really not necessary. Um, the majority of people, as I mentioned earlier, don't have a strong family history of disease. So that would be only the 15%. And out of this 15%, it should really be the ones that have uh, primary progressive MS. If they're really concerned that you, know, you have two or three siblings that have primary progressive MS, one of your parents had primary progressive MS, maybe you may consider uh, whether you want to get screened. I mean, there's currently no treatments for primary progressive. So it would really only be in a way to minimize all the other agents that you can try to minimize. For example, you could try to stop smoking if you use smoking because smoking is a risk for multiple sclerosis. So if you know you have the mutation, you have a high risk, you want to minimize everything else you can. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is an option of, doing, of taking high doses of vitamin D, which may help also slow down or potentially stop the onset of disease. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe if you eventually develop multiple sclerosis, it's good to know because your neurologist should be able to give you uh, probably more aggressive treatment because chances is that if you develop multiple sclerosis, you'll develop the progressive and severe form. So the neurologist should not be waiting six months down the road to see how you progress to really address how uh, aggressively to treat your symptoms. So it should really be a fairly aggressive treatment from the onset. But as I said, it's really, really a few uh, people that should really be seriously considering whether genetic testing is right for them.
Okay. And as I said, there's very little benefits. I mean, without doing the genetic testing, you could already do a lot of things like, you know, eat healthy, do exercise, stop smoking, and the basic things that we should all be doing anyway. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so I guess lastly, as we said, this is going to be going out to, to a number of people with MS um, who we already know are incredibly interested in the, in the work that you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. What are the next steps for your research and is there anything that, that people with MS can be doing to, to help you with, with your work? Um, the research, in, as it is at the moment, is going to be extended um, by creating an animal model of these mutations that we have seen. Uh, so the animal models we have for multiple sclerosis today have been very useful, but they don't really uh, copy or represent the mechanism of disease uh, that causes the disease in people. So the animal models are injected with myelin and develop an immune response that triggers the symptoms that look like a mess or they're fed a, a drug that destroys myelin. So now we are going to have in the next few weeks uh, an animal model which has the mutation that we've identified and you know it's really early days and needs to be fully characterized. Mm -hmm. But if there is a phenotype, a, a, a symptom like MS uh, that appears in these animals being, you know, myelin defects or gait problems or whatever it is, we have a model in which we can start trying and testing and developing new treatments for multiple sclerosis and a familial form of multiple sclerosis. And the other thing is really is for all the families that are interested in participating in, the, in our study. You know, the, the power in genetic really comes from the, the large collection of samples from all these families and all these patients, which is really a fantastic contribution to the research. So if anyone is interested in, in donating a blood sample and a basic description of the um, demographics and, and, you know, clinical history, um, we are more than happy to, to get people involved in our research. And you know, every person is another little piece of the puzzle for, for us to for the science and, and try to do everything we can to, to give back to all the patients. Okay. And for people who may be in that situation, what's their easiest way of, of getting in touch to potentially participate? Um, <laughs> probably I should not be giving them my email address. Um, but we have a whole set of clinical coordinators which are um, very knowledgeable and very, very, very smart people um, who can get in touch with, uh, with them and provide the, the consents and all the information so they know exactly what they're getting into. Um, you know, the, there's some, my website. I don't know if you can put it up on... Yeah, we'll put the link on, to that down the bottom of the link. video. And they can just get in touch with me and through the website, and then I'll get in touch with the clinical coordinator, and we'll be in touch. Okay. All right, fantastic. Well, it goes without saying that uh, we are extremely appreciate, appreciative of, of your time today, and I'm sure that the entire MS community is extremely appreciate, appreciative. Um, of uh, you giving up your time to, to do this interview today. We're extremely interested in your research, extremely excited about the, the possible outcomes of it, um, and we wish you luck for, for all of your future work. Thank you. You're very welcome. And, you know, I mean, we, I, we're just trying to give back as much as we can. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.